A time um, event in the end that we refer to as the Great Tribulation, that seven-year period, and that's what we're going to be looking up and the uh, looking at in the second half, or half of uh, Daniel seven, uh, verses nineteen to twenty-eight, entitled the uh, the future world uh, leader. Uh, we refer to him as the uh, the Antichrist. He actually has thirty-three titles in the Old Testament. He has thirteen different titles in the New Testament. We'll see some of them. Uh, this morning. Uh, last week we saw that he was introduced, Daniel refers to him as one of his Old Testament titles as the little horn. Uh, again, the horn means power or king uh, that gets raised up uh, in this last world uh, empire. Let's take a look at verses 19 to 28. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn uh, that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and, and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. Uh, after them, another kingdom will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and laws. Uh, the saints will be handed over to him for a times, times, and a half time. But the court will sit, and, its power will be, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter <clears throat> to myself. And again, we spent some time last week, uh, really, uh, in the early part of the chapter, looking at uh, the vision that Daniel has. We talked about the fact that, uh, that um, uh, mainstream-wise, most people see uh, Daniel 7 as being a parallel to uh, Daniel chapter 2, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interprets with these succeeding ki kingdoms. Uh, beginning with what in that dream was the head of gold or the Babylonian Empire moved through the Medo Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, eventually the Roman Empire. Uh, and, uh, and as uh, we get to the Roman Empire in that statue, it splits because it's the lower half. So it begins here, it goes to the thighs. So as we know, the Roman Empire did it split into east and west, ruling from Constantinople and also uh, from Rome. <laughs> Uh, history uh, basically played out exactly the way Daniel you know, basically said that it would in the interpretation of the dream uh, of Daniel 2. Uh, we also know then that <coughs> those iron legs went down into the feet where it became a conglomerate and the, the mixture of iron and clay together. Uh, there was still an aspect of that imperialistic Roman rule that was still there, uh, but it's divided now the ten toes representing uh, ten aspects or ten kings within that kingdom. Daniel comes back and reiterates the same thing as he describes four different beasts. We won't go through all of them again, but the fourth beast we said last week contrasted to the others. It was unique and completely different. It represented, as we kind of went, went around through the book of Revelation and brought you back around to say that um, it represents uh, the last world empire that will have world empire that will have 10 rulers over it. 
uh, the Antichrist will then be able to take control of those ten and become the what uh, John says, the eighth king or the last world ruler of this world. His kingdom then is destroyed and the kingdom of God is set up forever and ever. A little bit of review. <coughs> we uh, just uh, go on here. Uh, the first point, and uh, again, trying to keep it as simple as we can, uh, the world leader will be more dangerous than all the others. We see that in verses 19 and also verse 23. It's a beast pictured having iron teeth, bronze claws. It's, it's crushing, it's devouring, it's trampling its, uh, its victims. There's been other world dictators. We could think of Mussolini, we could think of Hitler, we could think of Pol Pot, we could think of uh, Stalin and so forth. We could look back at the uh, first Roman Empire, but uh, however brutal they were, there are nothing in comparison to the, the fourth beast, this last kingdom that's going to come. Uh, more dangerous also because of his deception, more dangerous because of the persecution that he will bring specifically against God's people. So more dangerous than all the others. And secondly, in verses 20 and 24, we see that the world leader comes to power in a uniquely different uh, way. It's not the typical uh, political or military. Uh, it's uh, somehow it's, uh, there's a religion involved. There's a world religion, and, uh, and it's uh, very different. Uh, verse 8 says, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up from among them. And, the, uh, and three of the first horns, if you just kind of say kings, were uprooted before him. They were plucked out, it means violently. The horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth that spoke boastfully. So first we'd say about his coming to power is that uh, it will begin when he is insignificant. He's, he's, he's a little horn. He just won't, um, you know, if we looked around today and, and said, well, are, are we living in those days? Is the Antichrist out there or whatever? Well, well, if he is, he's nobody we would know about. <laughs> he's really, he's insignificant at first. He's not a major power broker that is just uh, on the move and, and, and people are saying, oh, you know, maybe he's, he's the one. He, he comes up very insignificantly. He's the, uh, the little horn at first. But um, kind of make this a little more interesting uh, I want to uh, share a couple of things with you, though. I again, uh, this we know from this passage from Daniel 2 is, again, it's a Roman empire, an imperialistic uh, government that arises out of the old Roman empire. So sometimes we refer to it as the revived Roman uh, empire. And for years, for about <laughs> 100 years now, uh, Bible scholars have said it's going to rise out of Europe. Obviously, it's if it's going to be the old Roman empire. And when the uh, European common market came along, people went, we're a little closer, uh, you know, to that, that coming kingdom. Uh, and then when it became the European Union, uh, we were even a little more closely. And uh, uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting about the, the European Union is, is um, <laughs> I don't know if they know the Bible or not, but it's just interesting, some of the things that they do and some of their uh, symbols. And I want to show a, 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 couple of you, a couple of them to you. Um, uh, one of the uh, symbols of the uh, European Union is a woman riding the beast. I think I've got that on the next slide. You've got their stamp, uh, the European Parliament stamp on one side. You've got one of their coins. And on both of them, you have a, a woman riding a beast. Now, what's significant about that is what we read about in Revelation 17, verse 3. It says, And the angel carried me away in the spirit, this is John, the apostle, into the desert, uh, talking about the end times. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. Exact, again, like we're talking about here in Daniel 7, that, type, that kingdom. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, talking about, again, her royalty and wealth and so forth. Uh, was um, with glittering gold, precious stones, and pearls. She had a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Uh, this title was written on her forehead. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother, mother of prostitutes. And of the abominations of the earth, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore testimony to, to Jesus. Now, again, we'll see, as we've already read, and we'll talk about it more, part of what this government does under the Antichrist, the little horn and so forth, his different titles is that they persecute uh, the Jewish state of Israel in particular and really uh, any believers uh, in Yeshua or Jesus uh, at, at that time. 
uh, Mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great. And, uh, and again, that empire was what birthed basically uh, idolatry in a sense in, into the world. And so much that we see in, in religion that's out there today all came out of what we call uh, Mystery Babylon. There's really only two kinds of uh, uh, philosophies of religion in the world. There's the one that says God is without and, uh, and he's the creator and so forth. And, uh, and then it's just a, a, a question of uh, can I know him and so forth. There's the other one that says God is within and, uh, and I need to look within. Uh, and, and, and again, all religions, you're, you're, they're either in one camp or, or the other. And all the mystery Babylon religions are, are more of this idea of that God is within me. And of course, I can create an idol and worship him. Uh, you know, my life needs to be about my, my, my thing and what modern psychologists call self-actualization. You know, we use a lot of different terminology for it, but it all goes back to mystery Babylon. Now, what's interesting about the uh, European Union, uh, next slide, is that uh, this is one of their posters. Europe, many tongues, one voice. Hey, they know about the Tower of Babel. You guys are really biblical. Uh, of course, what was the Tower of Babel? Well, that was man coming together after God said to uh, multiply and fill the earth. And man said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're just going to stay together and we're going to build a ziggurat, a tower where we can worship the astrological signs that are there. We can use them to tell us the future and direct our lives. We don't need God. We're in complete rebellion against what he has specifically told us to do. That's the Tower of Babel. And, uh, and of course, you know the story. God comes down and confuses their, their languages. They're unable to communicate and therefore they, they are forced now to basically go into uh, different uh, parts geographically of the world and, and multiply and so forth. Uh, it's a symbol of absolute rebellion against God. That's interesting that they chose to use that as one of their posters. Uh, it goes further than that. Next slide. On the left, you have um, uh, Brucker's uh, Tower of Babel uh, painting of 1563. They liked it so much, they designed their parliament building after it. Their parliament building of the European Union is a Tower of Babel. Very interesting. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know who's inspiring these guys, but uh, it's all very coincidental. I mentioned uh, another um, uh, official within the European Union back a, a few, uh, you know, four or five or maybe six months ago named Javier Solana. Now, he's, he's interesting, and if you watch uh, the news, much CNN or if you watch Fox or whatever, or you occasionally will see him being interviewed because he is the, uh, he is the uh, representative of the European Union's for, uh, foreign and security policy. He was uh, previously a member of a uh, representative of NATO. Uh, he's one of these guys, if you, if you watch the news more in Europe and stuff, you would see him all the, all the time. He's the, he's the Condoleezza Rice of, uh, of the European Union, uh, basically, but different. And um, uh, he, his position was created by a, a policy where the European Union decided they needed to have an individual that would, on behalf of the European Union, the United States of Europe, uh, to go out and, and, um, and develop security policies, uh, develop por foreign policy, uh, in particular to go out and, and try to uh, set up uh, relationships with uh, other governments, uh, peace treaties and so forth, and these peace treaties would be for a, a period of seven years. Now, that kind of is interesting because we know that the, uh, the Antichrist, at some point in time, will represent this form of government, though much larger, more powerful at that time, a little horn at first, but rising. Uh, and he will go out and set up a, a seven-year relationship, a covenant with the uh, nation of Israel that will allow them to restore and rebuild the temple, so on and so forth. And that really is what kicks us off and gets us going into uh, the Great Tribulation. I don't, I don't think, I'm not saying that Javier Solana is the Antichrist. I'm just saying it's interesting that they've created a position like this already. A couple other things that are interesting. In 2000, the European Union gave, uh, uh, passed another resolution, resolution did I tell you that the one that brought him to power was Resolution 666? It's funny. It just kind of came up, that number. And, uh, and uh, that's the one that put him in, into power. Now, uh, that was in 99. And in 2000, they came back and set up 
Another policy whereby in an emergency, he would then be in complete control of all their military. He's in one man right now over the, over the European Union is in control of, of all of their security. It's the guys that got the guns. <laughs> all their foreign policy, all the guys that cuts the deals for them, and now all of their military, one guy like that. That happened in 2000. Uh, very, very interesting. There are right now 28 countries that make up uh, the European Union. There's only 10 full members. Everybody else that's coming in becomes in as a partner or associate or, or so forth. Also, in the, uh, in the building there, the new, newly rebe rebuilt Tower of Babel, <clears throat> that's their, their, um, where the, uh, their legislation uh, is set up uh, with representatives from all the various, these 28 countries and so forth. And they, uh, those representatives and others that are there number into the hundreds. Uh, but it's interesting, uh, as you go along, you know, the seating, and uh, you can read articles where they name off who's sitting and what seat. It's all assigned and everything. Uh, no one's sitting in one seat, though. 666. Six, six. They've left that one empty. It has not been occupied yet. Are these guys reading the Bible or what? I don't know, but it's just uh, <laughs> all very interesting. Again, Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a, the number of a man, and his number is 666. And I'll just tell you, <clears throat> we don't really know exactly what that means. His number, you know, does it have something to do with the binary code system? Uh, you know, we don't really know. But identified as it's a man, and he has a number associated with him, and that number is 666. And I just think it's interesting, these numbers go up quite a ways, but they've left that one open. This little horn will come on like that, is not really that powerful, but, uh, but he will uniquely become very, very powerful in a very unique way. Uh, the second thing, uh, his coming to power will involve a change of balance, and we've mentioned that before. There's uh, 10 world leaders, three fall before him. They're plucked out, one translation says, and that enables him to take over complete control. It's like he's able to swallow up the others in the same way. We might look at how there's no longer an East Germany. There's just Germany. East Germany was swallowed up into West Germany. Uh, it wasn't a political thing. It wasn't a military thing. It just is just something that happened. Obviously, it was somewhat political, but it was almost more of a social movement. A lot of this will be tied directly to a religious movement. Uh, also then, the uh, third thing, we know that the little horn is, is literally a man. Uh, other places, he's called the man of sin. Uh, Paul says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So uh, again, it's just, uh, it's a man uh, specifically that we're talking about. And then uh, the next thing, we know that he'll be a great uh, deceiver. And um, his pretense, uh, again, he sets himself up against God, against God's people. And um, he ends up eventually proclaiming himself to be God proclaiming himself to be worshipped. He has a, uh, his partner in crime called the false prophet, the other, one of the other beasts. There are three in the book of Revelation. Satan is referred to as beast. The Antichrist is referred to as beast. And then that world religion that uh, is at the end, the leader of that, the false prophet, is the beast that comes out of the, uh, out of the earth. He will help people see that this man is just not a great leader, not just a great savior of the world, because that's the way he will be hailed, but he's actually uh, God himself. Again, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.4, he will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So again, we know that that... Jewish temple will be get rebuilt on the Temple Mount. We've talked a little bit about that before. But uh, again, uh, when we talk about him being that title in particular, the Antichrist, it's a title that John gives him. It means he's against God, but also means, uh, or against Christ, it also means he's like. So he, he's going to come on the scene, um, uh, not in a uh, red, red suit carrying a pitchfork. You know, he's going to come on the scene like a present-day Jesus Christ. I mean, he is going to solve the Middle East problems. We will have peace in the Middle East. It'll be short-lived, 
uh, but he's going to be able to solve uh, the whole thing. I mean, they've been working at it for a long time. Nobody's uh, come close yet in terms of the conflict with uh, uh, Israel and its neighbors. This guy's going to make a way for peace. Everybody's going to hail him as a hero. He's going to figure out a way to feed everybody in the world. I mean, it's going to uh, look great. It's not like people are going, oh, I'm really afraid of this guy. I mean, they will later, but uh, certainly not uh, initially. Uh, we're told that he has the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke uh, boastfully. He's going to have tremendous intelligence and tremendous speaking abilities. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But uh, again, great, great deception. And uh, uh, in our generation or whatever, we may not really be able to understand that. If, if Charlie was here, he could help me out on this. But when Joseph Stalin came on the scene, uh, everybody in our country uh, saw him as a tremendous statesman, a great politician, a great world leader, and so forth. Uh, we just thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. At the same time, back in his own country, he was murdering over 30 million Russians. He was brutal. Uh, but uh, everybody in this country were absolutely, totally deceived by Joseph Stalin. And, there, and there's been other leaders like that as, uh, as well during the... During the the history of the world. And this guy will be like that. He will totally deceive. More dangerous than all the others, he comes to power in a uniquely different way. And then thirdly, this world leader is more distinctive uh, than, than all the others. I just mentioned the fact that uh, in verse 20 it says uh, that he looked more imposing than the others and, uh, and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke uh, boastfully. More imposing than the others. I uh, I want to read what King James, uh, New King James says, talks about the fact that uh, the horn that had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Uh, I don't think this means he's going to be like really big, <laughs> greater than his fellows, more imposing. There's something about this guy's uh, uh, appearance. His appearance is distinctive. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, this wouldn't really mattered much, you know, 100 years ago. It means everything today. Do you think somebody can win the election of this country if they don't look good on TV? No, they can't. I mean, whatever, whatever's about them, they've got to change in appearance. They change it. I mean, they, their, their image is very important. Uh, this guy will look like a world leader. You know, again, he's not going to walk around, you know, uh, uh, in, in a red suit carrying a pitchfork. I mean, this guy will look like a great statesman. Uh, he's going to uh, be very photogenic. He will look good on TV. He'll connect with people, be able to tell the right stories and, and so forth. And we've, uh, we've had um, uh, presidents recently that were, uh, that were very good at this and, and connecting with people and, uh, and the way that they spoke and, and, and so forth. This guy will have all of that and more. His power is uh, uh, distinctive as well uh, because he's empowered by Satan himself in this false prophet. Again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, we go back to that again. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will, uh, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or worship God so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. We go on down to verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy the splendor uh, by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those that are perishing. Counterfeits, uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. Paul calls them, uh, refers to them as lying wonders. I don't think they're lying wonders because they're not real. I think Satan is able to pull off some pretty miraculous things. I think they're lying wonders because they're, they deceive people. People believe the lie that's behind the miracle. Uh, and, uh, and so this guy will come on the scene, a great looking, great speaker, uh, tremendous wisdom, able to bring uh, peace to the Middle East, bring prosperity to countries that uh, uh, never saw it before at all. And he's going to be able to do miracles and, and uh, incredible things. And then he's got the false prophet that's able to do uh, incredible uh, miracles and signs and wonders as, uh, as well, so much that he's able to set himself up and be worshiped as God. I remember 
reading some of this, hearing some of this stuff as a teenager, and I just thought, no way. <laughs> I just thought, yeah, yeah, like, like people are really going to worship some other guy like he's God. You know, I mean, kind of naive and everything, but uh, hey, uh, we live in a different day. Uh, the, the Mormons all think they're gods, are going to become gods. Uh, you've got, I've been to India and seen some God men there. Nothing attractive about them, uh, but you know you have this intrinsic in people's belief systems uh, today. I remember a number of years ago, uh, on one of the earlier trips to China and going to uh, Beijing and going to Tiananmen Square and standing in, in Tiananmen Square, and you've probably seen the pictures of it, the big red wall and the big picture of Mao Zedong up, up there, and that's where all the military parades and, and so forth. It's also the, uh, the site of the uh, uh, democratic movement within China when the government came in and, and slaughtered, was reported hundreds. It was thousands of, uh, uh, of young men and women there in Tiananmen Square. So it's a very historic place. On the other side of that red wall where the picture of Mao Zedong is what's called the Forbidden City. And if you turn and, and look back the other way, in the middle of a square is a big monument and there's a line going for blocks. And I asked one of the uh, brothers that we are with, uh, what's that and why is there a line? And uh, that's where, that's the tomb of Mao Zedong. And uh, because uh, at a point in time towards the end of his life, maybe the last 20 or 30 years, they basically came out and said that he was God, that he was deity. He wasn't just a great leader. The reason he was able to be a great leader was while he was butchering his own people. But the reason he was able to be a great leader was because he was divine. Uh, and that's why people line up now to see, I don't see how you get to be divine and you're in a grave, but, you know, forget logic. People are lined up for blocks waiting hours to pass by and view the body of Mao Zedong. Now, again, what's interesting about that is that we're not in on the deception. You know, we're on the other side of it. We have a free press. Uh, you could read the book about him written by his per personal physician after his death who fled the country and then wrote a book of what the guy was really like and he called him a butcher. Uh, but people in that country will line up to view his body. They're totally deceived. And, uh, and there'll be tremendous deception when it comes to the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 13 says, uh, again, John writing, and he, the false prophet, performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. That's pretty good. Uh, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he was deceived, the, uh, Satan. He deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast, the Antichrist, who was wounded by the sword, yet lived. Kind of a fa little false resurrection there. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it would speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Point in time, in the middle of the tribulation, newly rebuilt Jewish temple, not only does he claim that he's God and to be worshipped, sets up an image of himself that is miraculously able to speak and so forth. And if you don't worship it, then you are killed. Uh, again, this world leader, more dangerous than all the others, rises to power in a uniquely different way and, and is more distinctive than the others. Fourth, this world leader will bring great distress upon God's people Again, we see that in verses 21 to 22 and also verse 25. Verse 25 says that uh, he will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and a half time. A time a year, times, two years, half a time, half a year, three uh, and a half year, period. Uh, First, we'd say that the world leader will begin by making peace with God's people, which we've, uh, uh, again, mentioned. He will have the ability to deceive the Jewish nation. Uh, they are at the point where they're ready to be deceived. I mean, they, they will, uh, if you ask them today, many on the street, and this has been like this for a, a number of years, uh, who the Messiah will be, or if they're expecting the Messiah, they would say, yes, we're expecting the Messiah. Who will he be? Uh, he will be a great political leader and give us peace in our country. <laughs> They're just, you know, for what they've been through uh, because of terrorism and so forth that has impacted them uh, so, so much in a greater way, more than, more than us. We can't even comprehend it. Uh, that uh, they, they are about to do anything. I mean, given half their country away, I mean, they'll do anything for, for peace at, uh, 
uh, at this point. And you know, when you've done these things to the least of these, my brothers, the Jews, during the tribulation period, it's like you've done them unto me. So those that have done those things, help those that were in prison because they were being persecuted, help those that had no place to live, help those that had nothing to drink, and so forth. The Jews during that tribulation period, then uh, they will then, those are the ones, people always ask that question, that repopulate the earth during the millennial Christ of reign. Those are the ones that we, as believers, will rule and reign over. So we're part of God's kingdom, his millennial kingdom, his thousand-year reign when he comes back to earth. The Antichrist, the false prophet are, are destroyed. And, you know, Satan's thrown in, in bound uh, for that thousand-year uh, year period. And uh, we rule and reign with him on earth. And, of course, if you've ever heard Pastor Chuck teach on this passage, he said he's already put his request in he would like to rule and reign over the North Shore of Oahu. <laughs> He's already put in his request. But uh, I don't know if we get to do that. But uh, it really won't be about us and what we're doing. It will be about Jesus Christ and his reign upon this earth. And that's why the prophet Isaiah said, For <laughs> to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government, the government of this earth, will be upon his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's what Isaiah is talking about. This millennial, the, the, the reign of the Messiah. And like I say, there's lots about it in the, in the scriptures and the prophets and especially the, the minor prophets. But one day we'll rule and reign with him. Again, back to Daniel, that verse 14. Uh, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And that's what we pray for. When the, uh, the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, teach us how to pray, like John taught his disciples how to pray. And he said, well, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, here on earth as it is in heaven. That's, this is what we're praying for when we pray for that. We're praying for the kingdom of the Messiah to come here on earth. Now, people can enter that kingdom. If you ever talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, they always come knocking at your door. And they always want to talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God that's going to come. Because they, they're very confused about the Bible, but they're also very confused about prophecy. And they have some strange ideas. But one of the things they kind of talk to you or want to talk to you about a lot is the idea of God's kingdom is coming. It's going to come here uh, on this earth. And I was, uh, always say to them that, uh, well, you can enter his kingdom now. Uh, no, his kingdom is not here yet, but you can still enter his kingdom now. Uh, Jesus said in John 18, 36, he says, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, otherwise, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. It's in heaven. We can enter his kingdom now. In John 3, 3, uh, uh, Jesus said, no one can enter the kingdom, no one can see the kingdom of God unless... You're born again. We can bow our knee to the Lordship of Christ, and when we do, we enter the kingdom. But one day, his kingdom that is from another place now in heaven will return and be here on planet Earth, and we'll be part of it. Now, I used to you know, kind of look at some of these things and get lost in the details when I was younger and think, well, I don't really have to know all that stuff because hey, I'm going to get raptured, I'm out of here, and... I don't know that I'll really know all this stuff that's going on. And then we just return with Jesus. So, you know, just give me the cliff notes, you know, or whatever, you know, just uh, give me the before and the after and I'm good. And you guys work out all the details kind of a thing. But God gives us all this for a reason so that we'll know the big picture, the whole story. I mean, if we go from the creation to the Christ's return, we're looking at a little snippet and prophecy gives us little pieces along the way. I think God wants us to know the details. He wants us to know the big picture. There's a world out there that says there is no big story. There is no meta narrative. 
And God says, yes, there is. <laughs> There's a really big story, and, and you're, you're all part of it. Um, I won't do it justice, but I, 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 I was really moved uh, during, uh, on Friday night uh, at this uh, truth conference as Dale Tackett showed us a uh, uh, what he said, a slide of one of his favorite pictures. And uh, it was a, kind of a classical painting of the Puritans. There's two or three of them on the beach. Uh, and you have uh, one of the vessels they, they sailed on, the Mayflower, uh, sailing out of the harbor. And then he, he told us this story. He said, uh, the idea behind the painting is, is this. Of course, when they arrived... Uh, the, the Puritans were, were believers that were in England that were being persecuted because they weren't part of the governmental church there and so forth. Uh, and they were being persecuted for their faith and their trust and their belief. It was a back to the Bible movement. They fled to Holland. <clears throat> they couldn't get good work there and, 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 uh, and basically lived in poverty there. Uh, they felt really led by the Lord and called by God to, uh, to, to sail to America uh, that that would be a place where they could have religious freedom. And, and, they're, and they're very explicit in their writings. They came only because they believed God called and directed them to come and establish a country that would have freedom of religion where God could be worshipped. And so they got on that ship and they came and they hit that first winter and within a month or so, two or three of them died. And, and by January, six or eight more died. And by the time they got through... <laughs> the winter, there was about 46 of them that were up on a hill that, that had died. And the painting, again, uh, is the idea of, uh, of the Mayflower sailing back to Europe because the captain <clears throat> refused to leave. He stayed till spring, and he begged them to get back on the ship and said, you'll never survive and so forth. You need to come back with us. And William Bradford, I'll have to find the quote for you. It's great, but I'll paraphrase. <clears throat> Basically, he says that, <clears throat> he says that, we came here because we were called and directed by God to come here. He says, and we're, we're going to build a nation where people can worship God openly and freely. And we may, may, not, we may not be the ones to see it. We may not be successful. But even if we're just the stepping stones for others to come along to see it done, then so be it. He had a view of a bigger picture. If we die doing this and don't see the success of it, that's okay. Because we're doing what God called us to do. Because we believe in a bigger picture of things. And we're going to follow God. And, and uh, Del Dackett's uh, per, uh, whole purpose in seeing that, showing that, is that we've, lo we've kind of lost that in the body of Christ. We believe a lie that think it's, up, it, it's all about me and what I get and what I can earn and what's in my IRA and what's going on and what I'm going to do with my retirement and and uh, all these things, my position, my power, you know, my car, my thing, <laughs> that's, you know, that's living for the world. And the body of Christ has believed that, and we've missed the meta narrative, the big picture. This is part of the big picture. And I think it helps us keep in mind. It's worthy to study, to understand what's coming ahead, what God is saving us from, what we're going to do in eternity because we're not living for this kingdom, kingdoms have come and gone. There's only one that's going to last forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we do pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. Here on earth, even it is in, in heaven. Lord, I pray that we would um, just get a, a picture of, of what's going to happen in the future, that we'd understand how we should live now. Peter says, understanding these things, how should you live? You should live in, with holy and blameless lives. Lord, may it uh, be so with us. May we understand that we're really not living for this world, for a kingdom that is coming that will last forever and ever. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.